Welcome to Insights. I'm Dick Goldberg, and our subject is how our emotions and our unique personalities affect our beliefs and our behavior around money, be it spending, budgeting, or investing. With us, Connie Kilmark. For 36 years, Connie's helped thousands of clients manage their budgets, their finances, and all their emotional issues around the subject of money. As president of Kilmark & Associates, she's traveled extensively, leading workshops and doing training on topics relating to including personal money management, consumer debt, and the psychological and sociological aspects of financial behavior. Welcome, Connie. Thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. You know, in 2008, Americans' level of debt got to, from what I recall reading the Wall Street Journal, about 130% of their annual income. And 15 or 20 years before that, it was about 80% of their annual income. In other words, it reached a record. Never had been that high. What do you think happened? Well, a variety of things happened. First of all, credit had never been more loosely given. Standards for um, giving credit were very low. If you could fog a mirror, you could get a credit card. Because of the computer and, and data management, we could differentiate products and interest rates, fees, associated with these products so that everyone had the appearance of a credit card but at very different price points. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, Americans' wages have been uh, declining since the 1970s in real buying power. So the first way that we masked that loss of buying power and the static nature of wages was women went to work. So we had two wage earners uh, attempting to accomplish what it used to take only one wage wage earner to accomplish. In addition to that, credit was an an interesting way to have the prosperity, the appearance of the prosperity that had once been paid for in cash. And so we acquired the things that one would imagine a a routine middle-class life ought to have, and we did it through borrowing. It was so normalized that it became absolutely ordinary. I mean, already I'm ahead of ourselves, but I'm hearing a psychological issue. Why did people have to get to that level if they had to borrow to keep up that level? Why wouldn't people go, well, you know, I'm just not earning as much, so I can't afford as much? Partly the reason is that the debt is a side effect of the acquisition. If you were a trucker that was taking furniture from North Carolina to Michigan, and you occasionally threw a piece of the tire off your 18-wheeler, you wouldn't think that what you were mainly doing Mm. on that trip to Michigan was creating a pile of used rubber on the side of the road. So most Americans were thinking of debt, given that the financial professionals had so freely bestowed it. These were, after all, the people who were supposed to know what they were doing with money. Um, They thought of it as a strange side effect and only occasionally looked at totals. It's amazing when I see clients in my office, that one-third of my clients who come in to talk about over-indebtedness, how infrequently they know the total. They misguess the total by a factor of two or three. And when we total up, they think of it as about a third or a half of what it really turns out to be routinely. Because it's unpleasant, denial is a way that we defend ourselves from Mm -hmm. that which we can't afford to know, and that goes for all kinds of unpleasant um, facts of living. So I'm hearing because credit was so easy to get, and because people were used to a certain lifestyle, instead of going in their pocket to support it, they just went to their credit card to support it? They were still going to their pocket because the monthly payments on those credit cards were the way that they afforded it. But, of course, what they were able to do through the the use of consumer debt was to exceed the buying power of their their immediate cash, walk out across the edge of the Grand Canyon, held up through a column of hot air called consumer credit. They didn't fall down. They were prevented from falling down. So the effect was the acquisition without the funding to, but it it worked. I don't get it. I don't understand how people can go so far in debt and not notice every month when the credit card bill comes in how much they got to pay every month on credit. I mean, it's like the monthly, our pa- the monthly payment is different from the balance, and the monthly payment is usually fairly manageable. There were credit cards for a while that were actually asking a payment 
too small to even pay the interest that was accruing. Uh -huh. These were negatively amortizing cards. Now, if, if the monthly payment is the only thing, the main thing that people are looking at, in fact, they say, well, until recently, I could afford this. But wait a minute. So, what, so what's the problem? If their monthly payment is manageable mm -hmm. and they keep buying and their monthly payment stays manageable, so what's the problem? If anything goes wrong with the income stream, if they need new tires and their cards are maxed out oh. And, oh. and or something happens with a job or there's a pregnancy or there's a disability. So as soon as the income stream is, is damaged, you end up having a house of cards that comes down. Is there any tricks that credit companies do? Like, you know, you say they give negative amortization. Well, I know it's like the subprime mortgages. You had real cheap payments at first as teaser payments. Mm -hmm. Did credit card companies do the same thing? Well, and what actually happens with credit card companies is that as you dig yourself into a bigger and bigger hole, and this was true until very recently, you would end up missing a payment, and then the interest rate would would skyrocket. Mm. There would mm -hmm. be penalties. Mm -hmm. So there were there was a huge use of fees and penalties as an income stream. But at that point, being tracked in the three major credit bureaus, you were cornered. You couldn't really easily mm -hmm. get out from that particular debt. So a, a cycle of refinancing the credit cards, moving balances, um, maybe using your home to get a second mortgage or a, a, a home equity line of credit, leaving the credit cards there, quote unquote, paid off when all mm -hmm. you had really done was rearrange to whom right. you owed the money, and then the credit cards start going back up back again. Up. Yeah. So mm, there could be three iterations of that pattern before somebody actually hits the wall. So I'm hearing that really there was nothing different in the psyche of Americans in 2005, six than in 1986, except they weren't making quite as much money, so they filled it in with debt to support well, their Well, and there were a lot of extra things that became normal. Cable, Internet, oh. uh, special cell phones, networked cell phones. Um, the number of things, the technological things, and the connectivity fees – that became routine, the number of televisions. The things that were normal for a household to have were really quite differently defined numerically, technologically, than they had been in the 70s okay, or so, the 80s. So to maintain a standard of living that seemed middle class or normal cost a little more, and, and people had a little less. And there's, so no national curric there's no national curriculum on money management. The parents are not teaching the kids because no one taught the parents. Ah. Is this issue a middle class issue, a lower middle class issue, a upper middle class issue? How does it spread out? Certainly the wealthy have financial advisors and they have more than enough to grease the wheels of all of whatever they want. So this is a matter of middle class and down in terms mm. of, of problem. We're, we're given norms on television and in advertising of what our lives are supposed to look like and then we go shopping and make our lives look like they're supposed to look like. Well, our interview is done, Connie, if we don't get into something psychological going on besides just it costs more to live and there's more credit. But I have a feeling you have something else to tell us. If we, if we look at individuals who might have issues with spending too much, spending more than they can afford, is there something, some other issues going on with some people that just spend too much and budget terribly? What we talked about before were, were averages. And so as, as with any average, it doesn't describe everyone. Some people are incredibly insightful and very aware numerically of what they're doing. Other people, and this could be seen as partly um, neurobiological, that mm. is brain-based, have a different way of making quantitative decisions. Um, there's a whole area of economics called behavioral economics that has finally caught up with the uniquely non-rational, I don't mean irrational, but non-rational way people make decisions, specifically quantitative decisions. So some people are incredibly rapid decision makers. They're impulsive. They um, see a, an, a distance of time in front of them that's maybe a foot or two. Other people are very long-term thinkers. 
interestingly enough, these people are often attracted to each other. So mm. the methodical person falls in love with the spontaneous person for very good reason. There's excitement there. The spontaneous person falls in love with the more organized person because there's some ballast sure. there. Sure. And as that relationship proceeds, usually they begin to find fault with each other. The, the spontaneous person begins to think of the more organized party as a bit anal yeah. and maybe controlling. Mm -hmm. The more organized person begins to feel terrified of the rashness of the decision-making style of the partner. So I would say that the rash or rapid decision makers, the folks that look for immediate gratification, the folks that we might say are always in the moment, yeah. these are the folks that are likely to have the hardest time with money. And it's a double-edged sword. Some of that quality is wonderful in certain professions, but it has that dark side financially. I've got a whole list of emotions here I want to go over with you. Sure. Let's uh, start with low self-esteem and money. How does having low self-esteem, which is a lot of folks, affect decision-making in your daily life with spending? We're primates, and all primates are hierarchical, and we look at each other and we want to know that we are okay, mm -hmm. and that if we don't feel that we're okay on the inside, we want to preserve the secret that's, of that. That's, that's lovely. As best Not we can. Not lovely, but it's well put. And so what we do is we ornament the outside in whatever way we can to pass for somebody who is okay. That can start as early as childhood. If you move a lot and you're always the, the, the newest kid in the class, you look at what other kids are wearing, what sneakers, what pants they wear, mm -hmm. and you want to model on that because you're not fitting in, you don't belong quite yet. Um, if there's trauma in the family, if there's abuse or alcoholism, um, what you end up with is a shame on the inside that you would like to preserve others from seeing or knowing mm. about. And we do that often through our material um, appearances and through the things that we own. Now, this is as a kid. I assume you'd project this to when you're 30, 35, the scars are still there? So Absolutely. still doing it? Absolutely. There's peer pressure at every stage of life. But in, the person who had the bad childhood is more prone to succumbing to that peer pressure. These ad, ad Especially if that person turns into a pretty high achieving driven person. They would mm. want these are the many in many cases, these are folks that work really hard to be the best, sometimes perfectionist. And as a result, sometimes um, that's their way of coping with that damaged childhood not through deep insight into oneself, mm -hmm. but rather through um, being as good as they can possibly be, which includes the material dimension. So having the stuff to show off. Sometimes it's through generosity. Sometimes oh. people um, with that kind of inner experience want to um, be as kind and as generous and as giving. There's a virtue in doing for others. Sometimes there can be people that are even pathologically generous. So there's a dark side even to generosity. Oh. I would assume for most, though, it's got to do with BMWs or an SUV or a house they can't afford, stuff like that. Well, it depends on gender. It depends oh. on peers. It depends on what matters in your particular comparison group. I'm interested in gender. Tell me about gender. Well, I don't know, but that internal combustion engines tend to be a, a, gen more male. a gendered kind yes. of thing. Yes. So... I would say if I were going to make a gendered statement, I would say that men buy fewer things obsessively, but they are much more expensive. Mm. And women will buy maybe more mm. small things, and they add up. Either way, you can get into wonderful trouble with your money. Well, let's if, talk about that. Is that retail therapy? Well, let's see what happens when you go into a store. You're having a blue day. You go into Neiman Marcus or you go into a love, some other lovely store. Everything is displayed in such an orderly way. It's so different from what may be the chaos of your own home. Everyone is nice to you. They're paid to be nice mm -hmm. to you. You have a certain amount of influence and power because you can say, I'd like to see this in another size, mm -hmm. and somebody serves you. There is a way in which, like a gambling casino, except... It, different. Yeah. 
a store can be a great relief mm -hmm. from the specific stresses of everyday living. You become important when you walk in there. You bet. For that little moment, the world stops and you are a piece of royalty. But I have a lot of emotions but to ask you about. I have a lot of emotions too, but it strikes me that retail therapy really kind of assuages a lot of them. Uh, depression, low self-esteem, boredom, mm -hmm. fair enough? It assuages them for the person who's vulnerable to yeah. this particular area. Oh. Gambling does the same thing for gamblers. Alcohol and drugs does the same thing for folks that fall into those traps. All of these behaviors, when done to excess, are ways of preserving ourselves from a feeling or set of feelings that we don't want to experience. They're all ways of buffering what's going on. Let me ask you this. We're talking about emotional, certain personality types and how they get you in trouble. But let's say you're pretty grounded, mm -hmm. pretty squared away. Mm -hmm. Can you still get in financial trouble with debt? You can in the sense that the way that um, the way that debt and borrowing became so normal, the way that um, lenders promoted, almost like drug pushers pushing mm -hmm. debt, um, the way that it was promoted was so unwise and so, but so ordinary. You, you remember the years when we were receiving promotions for 0% credit cards every other day. Um, I think that, that the American people are deeply optimistic people. I think that we have our whole history believed in taking risks. We wouldn't have come to a new continent if we were not profoundly optimistic. We are an immigrant nation. Most of us came voluntarily, not all of us, but most of us. And there is in our DNA as a nation a kind of risk-taking optimism mm -hmm. that I think um, preserved us from actually seeing the facts and seeing, you know, if something goes wrong, where is this going to end? And I think we're waking from that dream now. We're saying, ah, now we understand a little bit about how this can end. I never imagined that Americans would change as swiftly as they have. There's a carefulness, there's a dread of debt, there's an awareness of what kind of slavery it equals, you know, when you have so much debt that you can't pay it, you lose a house, you lose part of your paycheck. And there's enough of us going through that now that people are talking about it. Why do you it's, call that slavery? You don't own your own future earnings. Mm. I see. As you borrow, part of what you may not even be able to earn in the future still belongs to someone else. They have a claim on the productive capacity of your future. I read a study that people who can postpone gratification and who can do things that are not pleasant at the moment tend to be happier people than the people who need immediate gratification and take it and defer doing what they need to do. It's a, a hallmark of maturation. We think of de being able to defer gratification as a, an important stage of human development. But you've heard enough about um, persons who, even as adults, are like boys. They're sort of boys with toys. Right. There are enough folks that are not able to learn that skill, or it hasn't been rewarded in such a way that they maintain almost a childish grabbiness about, I want it now, even as adults. Well, this sounds pretty pervasive, though. I mean, if we have a country where so many people are doing this, do we have a country of a great majority that don't know how to postpone gratification? Well, do you think about, if you think about the way that people are plugged into iPods and on the computer and looking at their email at every mm -hmm. other moment, many um, folks who study the way that this is changing our uh, ability to attend are worried about the fact that attention span is getting smaller and smaller and all of what we're being called on to do is attend to now and now and now. If there isn't the ability to attend over a duration and imagine over a duration, it's going to be pretty hard to predict the consequences of choices right this minute until you bump into them. And even then, people will say, but how could these numbers be real? 
I don't have anything to show for it. I didn't you make mean the any big, debt? big I, yes, I didn't make any big purchases. How could these numbers be true? And that's the chasm between the seemingly ordinary purchases, let's call those grains of sand, mm -hmm. and the Sahara Desert over on the other side. What are, what are those normal purchases? What are you referring to? Too many pieces of eating out, Christmas presents or uh, birthday presents, trips that were, after all, every other kid gets to go to Disney World, my kids should go too, um, clothing, uh, generosity to other people. Just any number of very ordinary things, very oh. ordinary things, but n enough of them, routinely enough put on credit cards, and no attention to the total balance, only the monthly payment. You know, one thing I wanted to ask you that has always struck me as curious, and I guess I feel a little self-righteous about it, is the McMansion. Mm -hmm. I look at these cavernous, this is very opinionated, but these, you walk into a three-story high atrium, with marble, et cetera, and it became kind of common upper middle class style to buy these six, seven, eight thousand square foot homes for a couple with one kid or no kids. Can you explain what was going on there? Well, what's more obviously um, conspicuous consumption than your home? It speaks about who you are even when you're not in it. But if you think about the fact that that's seven or eight thousand square feet of area to heat and probably on a septic system because you need a very large lot for those mm -hmm. those um, houses. I think what we're coming to now is a kind of interesting convergence. People are thinking green. They're thinking walkable. They're thinking local food because we've learned that we can't trust, in some cases, the food system that we've got. We're learning on a variety of levels about things that I think are converging, energy, housing, food, um, community, and all these things are, I think, arriving at a moment when the trust that we may have in institutions like banks mm -hmm. and investment companies has never been lower. Sure. We're turning to each other and we're turning to the people that we can see and we're saying some of our wealth had better start coming from our relationships with each other. So does this mean there's a glut of McMansions no one wants? Absolutely. Have you really? noticed what's happened well, no, to their prices? No. They've really fallen more than other houses? More so. And especially where the building boom was the most reckless. As you sure, know, sure. certain states are far more uh, rab rabidly impacted than other states. Particularly these extended suburbs further out in the city mm -hmm. that built these big tracts of big homes. But if we can go back to 2000, pre-2007, mm -hmm. Are, are, is what I'm hearing, the reason people bought these big homes with one kid or no kids was basically they're insecure and they're trying to show off they're okay? Well, remember the dot-com bust happened around 2000, and people were saying, well, if we're not going to make our money on investing in enterprise, uh -huh. at least land, at least real right. estate yeah. is going to be a good investment. So it wasn't just... So there psychological was, insecurity. There was a tremendous was, pressure. I mean, people really thought as long as it keeps uh, going up, we can flip it, we can sell it, it's a good investment. You know the line. Okay. And you could have one house and then you could have a second house. And that's just investment. That's mm -hmm. a rational decision, not coming from an emotional need. It's always both and, Dick. Is it? Always. Okay. So let me pick on a person, okay. a guy who owns Oracle. I guess I can say this because it was in the Wall Street Journal. I read an article about all his many mansions, and I believe he also has one of the biggest yachts in the world. Now, why? I mean, he can because he can, for sure. The guy's on Forbes 400. But people like this who have many, many homes and really, really rich people, what? How, how do you see that from inside out? Well, it's interesting because you compare that to Steve Jobs' fairly ordinary, yeah. nicely large, but not obscene house. Very different styles of, 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 of behavior. Yeah. yeah. But I want to know what's making him tick. Honey. I think you're going to have to ask him. Oh, come on. Don't you have any guesses? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's about being seen to be competitive, the best, handsome. Mm. I mean, some people would say that all the skills that men have is, are ultimately about getting the girl. Mm. So, and, and money and the things it can buy, those things are all symbolic in the sense that 
yes, you can live in a house, but it's what the house says about you. It's the, what the house does to enhance your, your comeliness, if you will. So okay. I think down underneath it, there's a certain way in which what we own is supposed to make us more successful. For men, it's certainly true. And the lesson is that about money is it doesn't do that? Well, in the end, if you need eight or nine houses, one might suggest that it's not working or else why would you need eight or nine of them? It doesn't seem to end. Right. So if people come to you swimming in debt, mm -hmm. how much of your work with them is rational, laying out the numbers versus working with their emotions? The numbers come very late in the work. Oh. Most of the time, I'm doing a lot of undivided attention paying, listening, because they've already done a great deal of gnashing of teeth and being ashamed of themselves, and often a tremendous amount of turmoil within the family, a lot of fighting, a mm. lot of blaming, a lot of shaming. And as a result, it's a very dangerous subject. To earn the trust of anyone who comes to see me, I have to actually enter their world. I have to live inside the way that they understand their universe, what they are, what, what matters to them, how they see the world. And only after they can trust that I'm an ally mm -hmm. do I have the authority or the privilege of visiting where their money is going. Because until it's safe to look at that, it's going to feel terribly dangerous. But at that point, then you tell them, oh, you can't spend here, you got to spend there, you got to cut back. No, but they tell themselves, because as we write down everything that they're doing with their money, they discover what they can and can't continue doing. Do they learn anything about themselves? Deeply. Like what? They learn limits. They learn that they, that they can say no to a, a child, and the child won't um, die of, of desire for something. They learn that um, they have to begin to be wise in the way that they proceed in life, that they are that the value of their labor ought to reap for them things that are really valuable and not just whatever the next fad is. That seems like a big paradigm shift, though. It's tremendously deep. The people that come through this program, which is not something that happens all in one little meeting. People that come through it are not only different in a way that allows me to be fired, that is to say I'm always working right. to be unemployed in a client's right. life, but it allows them to speak much more wisely to their children and to their peers so that they become in a funny way the best marketing tool I have, which mm -hmm. is essentially mm -hmm. I was sure. where you were where you are and or I don't want you to be to learn the same hard way that I did here's a resource what are some of the lessons to learn in that process it sounds rather grandiose to say that the door of money in a person's life is a door into all of the other areas of meaning it's as just as good a door as the door of relationship mm -hmm. or any other because the way that you see Earning and status and buying and giving is really about the way that you systematically interact with the fact that you're part spirit and you're part matter. So it's as metaphysical a subject as any other subject could possibly be. People learn about their limits. They learn about their mortality. They learn about their what's really important in life. Which is? Certainly not the latest fad or the number of, of presents under the tree. That's pretty profound, though, to, to take in that lesson, isn't it? I mean, do most of your clients get that after a Absolutely. while? Absolutely. Wow. So they go from... They change their worldview because they have no choice. Oh, that's fascinating. So, in a way, maybe it's, it's a good thing. It's not just about money. Yeah, but that's what they learn. But before, it took this crisis of, of drowning in debt for them to take an honest look at themselves that's and their... A, that's a third of my clients. About a third of my clients come in with that description. Another third or more have plenty of money, don't have much debt, but are harming each other and losing their marriage or their relationship over money, sometimes business partners. So oh. even when there's not debt, you can have mortal combat over the subject of money, style of decision-making. The subject is 
is inflammatory. It's radioactive in the way that it inflames questions of survival and of being okay. Success, status, all of those things are profound about the way that we feel about ourselves and each other. One final area I want to talk to you about is investments. I'm assuming most of the work you do with people is over spending, consuming, uh, extending, you know, spending more than they should and they can afford. But does this also have an effect on how you invest your investable money? Sure it does, in the sense that you have to have a longer um, thought process. You have to be able to see a longer length of time in order to be an investor. The very mm -hmm. act of investing means that you have some belief about there will be a future so that when you put it aside or invest it, it not only should grow, but you will be there to reap some of the benefit, or you can see long enough ahead of you that you want others to reap the benefit that you've planted for them. Um, all of the work that I do is um, aimed at allowing people to live on somewhat less than they make so that mm -hmm. they will have more safety, more security, I and see. something to invest. But often they are afraid of that world because they don't know the words, they don't know what's going on in it. So I often am in the, the first teacher. What is a mutual fund? What is a bond? That's what is a stock? And to have a, a, a friendly teacher that's not selling those products do the teaching is often a very good place to start. But you're introducing them because you're showing them to save some money rather than right. spend everything you've that's got. Right. Well, Connie, I have enjoyed this, and I wonder if there's any one last thought from all of this, I don't know if you have one thought. I'm kind of hearing something underneath all this about life and money. Money is not the meaning of life. Money is a tool for living a good life. With that, I thank you, Candy. It's been a pleasure. And I hope you'll join us on the next edition of Insights.